Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be taking a look at the Spawn Vault Edition, volume number two today, man. Uh, taking a look at issues eight through uh, 11, 12, something like that. Uh, but first, I want to invite you guys to like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new vids are available. That'll help you get your hands on the books that we talk about uh, and help mitigate that kayfabe effect. Uh, also, if you watch these videos to the very end, that helps push our YouTube content out to other uh, comic book loving YouTube viewers. Helps us grow our subscriber numbers, man. And we're on the race to 6.3 million subscribers, but we're only a, a percentage point of the way there. Also, uh, in the spirit of spreading the word about comics, Jimmy and I are starting a new tradition here at Cartoonist Kayfabe. And uh, the very last Saturday in July, we're starting something that we call Comic Book Christmas in July, man. And what that means is for the makers out there and for the comic fans out there, we want you to gather up your doubles. Makers out there, we want you to gather up uh, any of your comps that are collecting dust. And you know those free little libraries that you have in your town, in your city, in your neighborhoods? Go stuff those things with some comics. Uh, let's let's generate some new readership out there and do everything we can to create new comic book readers. I know after getting that complete mad uh, collection, I went through a bunch of magazine boxes. Some people are going to be getting their hands on some some uh, old mad doubles that I, <laughs> that I have laying around, man. But uh, this is an important thing to us. We want to generate more comic book readers over time, and I think that this could be a pretty cool way to do that. Without further ado, Jimmy, you ready to uh, crack this sucker open? Let's dive in. And of course, you guys know that we did uh, Vault Number, Vault Edition Number One, before. Yes, I missed that book when it came out for whatever reason, and had to jump on this second edition because uh, I dig McFarlane's pencils like or, or inks seeing it like this at this scale. Just looking at this right here, man, I'm like, what is that? But then that's a sword, so it makes me wonder: is that Medieval Spawn? Is this issue <laughs> nine? Yeah, we'll, we'll find that image as we go. This is the run of Spawn 2 that I consider the, the good run, like the first 12 issues. Yes. And uh, I, I feel like a lot of stuff happens after that. Batman, Spawn, different things to mitigate it a little bit. Toys. But this stuff stays, you know, like this is when I think of the best of Spawn. This is kind of it, at least with the Todd McFarlane art. We covered many of these uh, issues individually, and I made a, a one-page comic before just highlighting that this is the first... Neil Gaiman comics, Frank Miller comics, Alan Moore comics, and Dave Sim comics I ever read. That original art material was in here, and there was specifically one piece that I was very excited to take a look at. Uh, and you probably know what it is once once we get there. So being, being able to compare and contrast uh, that sequence, which I certainly will point out. Look at this right here. Angela, Count Nicholas Cogliostro in Medieval Spawn, co-created by Todd McFarlane and Neil Gaiman. See our court deposition videos about, about this credit piece right there. Yeah, I was mildly surprised that that was able to be in here, yeah. that, that book. Because this is a recent publication. It is, after yeah. After the uh, court proceedings <laughs> reached their conclusion. Issues 8 through 15, man. So I think... Oh, geez. Let's see if we can spot some ghost inkers and things like that along the way. Uh, but we are getting started with the Alan Moore issue. This is the one where we uh, were showing off the cover to this sucker. Uh, some of the kayfabers were like, how does Spawn stand? <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I can't argue with that at all. It's cool to see some of the, it looks like blue line yeah. on some of the drawing there. Yeah, I think this guy was operating at such a fast pace. Uh, I've seen his pencils before, quote unquote, in that Marvel Abrams book with uh, Spider-Man issue number one. And he just, he does a lot of drawing in ink. But so cool, man. The stuff really is different at this size. I don't think that all of the artist editions feel as different, but like this is a really different effect. Also, these comics in color were printed pretty dark. Yeah. So you really kind of get to see that that Hunt 102 detail, that noodling, a lot of that drops off. Yeah. Uh, even on good paper in the in the regular comics. Love seeing Tom Wozniakowski going ham and doing his thing, man. Billy Kincaid, backed by popular demand. Oh yeah. <laughs> This is one of those great lessons, man. Like, when you have just the tapering straight hatch line, it really flattens out your shape. Yeah, very much. The best the best of pen and ink artists, they figure out a way to give you volume. Look, you can go right down the leg, and when you get to the ankle, I think that's a much more effective version of it. Yeah. And it's even still parallel you, lines, you just but they're not piece. going uh, from side to side in the leg. It's just one side. Yeah. 
And then that, and it's so interesting, these marks, because this is a different mark than that, but this really does create a soupy atmosphere. I like it. Yeah, it's good. It's uh, a little bit disgusting. It Chunky. is. Yeah. That's disgusting, too. These are so strange to see. I think we commented whenever we looked at this issue, but like seeing kind of like the, the open shapes, we've talked about him doing that as a shadow effect in, in places, too, and it's it's pretty bizarre. <laughs> we should... We should have been prepared with a piece of tracing paper, Jimmy. <laughs> Trace this off and see where that other eyeball goes. Do you remember that show called uh, uh, Monsters? It was like a, uh, it was like a Tales from the Crypt type show in the '80s. The opening sequence, it's a crane shot from up above a suburban neighborhood and goes into the uh, front window of the living room of a Cyclops family who's watching monsters <laughs> on TV. Unforgettable to me. That's something that I don't think you would see in most Todd McFarlane comics. You know, like, that's something Alan Moore's making him draw. Yeah, he's getting biblical. It does, it feels uh, European, it feels British. Like, it feels like something that you would see in a uh, 2000 AD comic. It's another background that we haven't seen yet in terms of pushing that Hunt 102. Yeah, the... In different uh, directions. The tic-tac-toe board made famous by Art Adams. I'd like to see Alan Moore's script for that last splash page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Elvis. Like, none of this is what Todd McFarlane would have chosen to draw. Part of the fun of having these writers come on board. Yeah. Part of the fun for an artist edition, too, because you're getting some of this variety. Not 100% sure, but this pose, like, is making me think of that uh, Floronic Man from... Uh, Swamp Thing? You know what? Yeah, this page, even before you said that, I was thinking, like, it does resemble the uh, the 80s Swamp Things. Yeah. I'd like to go through these McFarlane books uh, whenever I feel like my panel layouts are kind of getting a little bit stale. Mm -hmm. And just seeing, like, what you can do to design cool-looking pages. Yeah, I was really admiring that layout. Having the reverse silhouettes as your, like your frame. It has nothing to do with comic book storytelling, but it has everything to do with just uh, making cool drawings. I would be curious to uh, have like a Scott McCloud weigh in on a page like this in terms of storytelling. Because mm -hmm. it defies the way that book defines a lot of the panel-to-panel -panel stuff. But I do think there's storytelling that can be done there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's something I've been interested in a whole lot lately is like, you know, playing around with the panel shapes, but still trying to hold on to that story because my favorite guys who lay out interesting pages would be it'd be McFarlane, it'd be Sam Keith it'd be uh, Jamie Hewlett storytelling is always a little dicey on all these guys but it's all engaging on just a visceral level I'm also surprised that other image guys have not done their own artist edition style book like this because so many of them are known for their art like you would think they would be leaping at this and like McFarlane showed you, you guys are publishers, you can make whatever book you want. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I he, want a dragon one so bad. I, I think, he, well, I think one guy is the custodian of all of those yes. pieces, <laughs> but I do think that uh, for the rest of them, that all that stuff is just piecemeal. Yeah, hard it's to hard find. to tell what they have. McFarlane held on to everything. Some of the, uh, some of those early image books, they just don't have, you know, it's, it's, the digital transition was happening at the time, and I don't know that the archives are in good shape. When you see these kind of bits, uh, you remember that George Perez is a guy that would come up in uh, Todd McFarlane interviews quite often. Yeah, it has that early George Perez Spawn pinup. Uh, is that issue one? It's early in the Spawn run. McFarlane also makes stuff look bigger. You know, like everybody's kind of working this size, but he, he's very good at... I don't know if it's creating an impact. I don't know if it's the page design, but it just feels like a lot of this stuff is big. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Oh, man. Wow. Past the wet test. Do you, do you think this is tears after the judgment <laughs> came down from, from the, from the uh, cir Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and talk about Tom Warzakowski showing his stuff, man. Yeah, man. That's unbelievable. You know, like, that's all a font today. Yes. It is really nice letter. And look at what we have. It's like one font, two fonts, three different typefaces on a single page. Earning his pay. Iconic image, right? It is. This uh, this issue nine 
man, it's one of the one of the first issues I got. I got it at the Woodlawn Flea Market right over here, and the dude had a spinner rack. It was like one of those, you know how there are these, and I don't know who buys from these guys at the flea market, but it's the person that has like whole bunches of ramen noodles and ketchups <laughs> and like canned goods and shit. And there was one spinner rack and it had all spawn nines. <laughs> <laughs> A box of these fell off the truck. <laughs> when I was talking about scale, right? Like yeah. this is really big and I can't remember if this is the spread in the comic or not, I think but you can look at it as like one page, huge horse and medieval spawn. Next page, the smallest horse and medieval spawn you could do for, again, to contrast that size. Like if you want something to look big, you got to show some small stuff somewhere else. Yes. Yeah, that's fair. And, and it's essentially an establishing shot. So, you know, you established it. You drew that horse one time. Why bother drawing it a bunch more? Also, for your interesting page layouts, reverse silhouette, silhouette, right next to each other. Yeah, that's interesting. If this wasn't Neil Gaiman writing that, man, there'd be a lot to say. That's really funny looking. Those two characters' backs. <laughs> this is really uh, effective right there. That's that's really that's probably like the most ambitious Todd McFarlane background I've seen. I like seen. to picture him on the phone talking to his buddies and inking. Totally. When they would talk about that. That feels like it. They're, Look they're, at the drawing here. The white line. Mm -hmm. That's that's wild. You don't see very much Todd McFarlane stuff that looks like that. This one looks real good in the color. It's almost like the animated spawn, that, that white line. Yeah. Look at these weapons, dude. At this era, weren't you drawing weapons for your dudes with like these crazy blades that are, that are totally uh, inefficient? <laughs> yeah, that one is hard to decipher. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like prototype drawing for a toy I'm going to make. Like this thing would shoot, right? <laughs> Yeah, there'd have to be a warning, an age warning for... Uh... Oh, you ain't swallowing this. <laughs> I think it would be like a tried and fish hook. <laughs> Almost Sin City-esque, the, the use here of the black with the... Even that negative shadow that you pointed out on, on the mm -hmm. previous had, had that vibe to it. Man, so nice to get that Orzakowski lettering on the boards. Yes. Todd, Todd has a nice collection of stuff here, thanks to that. It looks like Orzakowski was excited for this, because this stuff is so crisp it's I, so good looking as, as as far as i know like todd just made sure he paid everybody the best rates that they had at the time so like steve olive like bumped the spawn pages up ahead of every other gig he was working on up ahead of akira and or zakowski this is really great yes your your page borders to have that like this is the old we're going to tell some origin stuff here an old story and you make it look like old paper cracked up in parchment you know something man i i gotta give a sh shout out to uh some a cartoonist that has nothing to do with this era of comics at all but mimi pond is working on a graphic novel now uh if you go to her instagram she's putting up page after page as she gets it done every single page is laid out in a different super interesting way using postcard imagery using i like a driver's license type draw like there's so much going on on every page it makes me think that she's just sitting there thinking for five hours before she even starts to put that page together because every page seems very thoughtful and incredibly well designed this is the page that i was like let me see what we're looking at here because when we when we get to the finished drawing of this it's a different drawing. Like, you know, it's it's 90% of the way there. The spawn is different in uh, the final drawing. But I was, like, curious to see where the paste-up was here. And this is issue 9, but that's in issue 10 where we see the finished drawing. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, he just got hold of the Dave Sims script first. But then it's like, you know, is Todd doing this level of pencil for all of his stuff? There's some really odd marks, too, because some of these are pen marks. You know, like, this the squiggle on that face looks like a pen line? Yeah. Compared to some of the stuff that looks like pencil. And I think it is. Uh, I think, you know, he made his high contrast Xerox. Like, you could see the fidelity of, like, the shitty old bubbly Xeroxes. And then he's going in and adding to it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You yeah. see a lot of artists will do that. Yeah. It's cool to put it in there, though. You have to. That's a very inventive thing. Uh-oh. Cagliostro. <laughs> I wonder what kind of reference, if any, he has for stuff like this. I love his boxy-ass cars that are like that. <laughs> like, I love them, man. It, it seems kind of functional, but it seems like it's from his own universe. Like, I can tell the Todd McFarlane car anywhere. 
I appreciate going from an alley that's all grungy and covered in ink to like, okay, we're in a different setting. How do I make it look different visually? Even that building, you know, looks like some of the few straight edges that he's putting putting down. Yeah. They uh, they show it off in the color really well, too. It, I remember it's very green, very, like, mute green, you know, to go nicely with her ginger hair. Continuously with his anchor pieces on every page. Even these kinds of panels, I feel, have that anchor quality, right? Like the giant eyeball. Look at that, dude, a little paste up. Mm -hmm. You know, he spent a lot of time on that building. He wasn't going to draw it twice. Wow. When you see this stuff, you know instinctively to look in the margins because he's going to have some Steve Olive notes. Steve Olive just sold, uh, sold a gang of uh, Akira Color Guides, been about over 100 pages. I popped on there. Because I saw the announcement the day before, and every page was on hold whenever I popped on. Dude, he was selling them shits for 60 to $100. Uh, had a whole grip of them at Heroes Con, like, 2010, 11. Yeah, it's a regret. There's your Felix. Yeah. <laughs> Always good with the liquids. Mm -hmm. Always good with the liquids. That Spawn costume looks fun, too. I just feel like it's a different set of details that you notice whenever you look at it like this. Yeah, you got some practice with it on that Alan Moore thing. That does not look like McFarlane. Inks. Some of those look so much like Golden to me. Sure. There was one on a previous page where Spawn was flying across the, the page, and it kind of reminded me of Golden. More of the liquids. And uh, getting a little bit more ambitious with white media yes. here. That back three-quarter view of a chick's face, or a, a, any human's face, not mm -hmm. easy. Not easy. And then put Road Warrior... <laughs> face paint on it's even tougher I love three three point comic book city perspective I used to love drawing that shit as a kid yeah that would always blow my mind when I first started looking at those books and they would have their perspective demonstrations that was always the super dramatic one Quesada would do that with covers yes where you would get like almost three versions of like the, the buildings closing in on you yeah and I would stare at them and try to figure out like How's this work? Like, yeah. this seems impossible. Yeah. Look at that. Man, you see, this is definitely... I'm calling Rob up, and we're going to talk about the Tina Turner concert. <laughs> Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Jim Rugg, right now, on the stands, has Hulk, Grand Design, Monster, and Madness, where he distills down 60 years of Incredible Hulk lore into two 40-page volumes with an inevitable trade paperback Marvel Treasury size book that I got to look at the PDF. It's going to be the book of 2022. Uh, Red Room, Trigger Warnings, issue uh, one, th two, three, and four are on the stands. As we speak, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Every issue is completely self contained. It is banned in more than 28 countries, it is banned in more than 10 comic shops. Also forthcoming is the Trigger Warnings trade paperback coming out, I believe, the same day as the, uh, as the Hulk Grand Design comic man so that is going to be an important day in cartoonist kayfabe history now that we're done paying the bills back to the video there it is make make sure to watch our video the most expensive comic ever made uh for our in-depth coverage of that issue and now we're jumping into the dave sim cerebus issue yeah another one that we've looked at and talked about and just what a bizarre reading experience this was for a generation of us is this todd trying to Get his handle on uh, Cerebus proportions or something? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think there's a Sam, there's a Sam and Twitch show that's coming out this year. Really? Yeah. Man, haven't thought about them in a long time. Do you get the sense of? Uh, do Do you ever, as we're going through here, call out when it looks like McFarland's behind we're, uh, on I, deadline? I don't know about behind, but but it either looks like he's being more spare or there's somebody helping uh this is different kinds of marks like these marks are capullo-ish like when capullo starts to to come on so i wonder if he's having a ghost hand in here there's more of that flatness that we were talking about yeah there's some real strangeness to this spread like some of the marks on the ropes here look bizarre yeah there's good energy to this man that feels like a real solid push which is two hands showing. Like, I think it's all in the flex of the fingers, so like the bend 
sells it, I think. Yeah, that's a hard thing to draw. Yeah. There, there it is, go. dude. The money shot. That's amazing, thinking of that previous panel of this drawing. Yeah. And like, was that a layout? Like, was he doing layouts for himself? And then this is your finished piece? Yeah, that's the wild thing, man. Like, like what the heck? What the heck? What are we looking at here? And he might have been doing layouts since he was working from someone else's script. More dynamic angle here. It's pretty straight up and down here. And you can see, like, the big change really is the spawn. Yeah, definitely. But uh, looking at these things, like, it's almost one for one, these hands. So I think he's a light boxer, dude. That could be, especially for something like this where you need to work it out. Yeah, yeah, these perspectives, much easier to do in a piece of 8.5 by 11, that, unless you know you have the Jeff Darrow hinge wing nut uh, rulers that your dad right. made you in his carpentry practice. You also need to figure out, like, details for hands to be recognizable as characters. Yeah, what are the ones, you man? got to get certain stuff right. And then, like, I was wondering, like, maybe it's on the... Man, maybe it's on the back of the paper or something That's that, true. that that uh, you, you give your notes to Steve Olaf, like unless Steve can just like eyeball it. But here, it's it might not be so easy. Like I could tell that's Joker. You know who's this though? Who's that? Well, that's Hulk, probably. Yeah, that should be Hulk. And there's that one yellow guy that we always are like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> Good at that amorphous shit too. Like beyond just the liquids, just anything that has no hard edges, smoke energy mcfarland has uh, uh some language for that that stuff's a lot harder to draw than than you give it credit for. it really is and i don't mean you i mean anyone. totally how about that dude yeah i like that that's really nice where's akowski's man that dude's sharp yeah i can't even <laughs> explain to you how much i would just stare at this stuff and think Man, they're following such a badass. I never understood that either, and I would always try whatever surface, especially if it's a close-up or something big where it's like, oh, that's a lot of white space. Try to fill that stuff up. And it became so freeing to me whenever I would see artists who were like, oh, yeah, you don't have a million marks on a face. Right. <laughs> like a young adult face. Just smooth skin. It's white, white, white paper. Cool color on hand here. Bud. Ka, 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 boom. Yeah, man, there's your energy burst. Once again, this is like a uh, Michael Golden kind of stroke because all of this stuff is done in, in pen. There's no brush weirdness. I guess maybe a little bit right there, but there's a lot of line drawing here. And, you know, he's he's good at drawing. There's like a center of the explosion, and it all seemed to abide by that. <laughs> The guys who would uh, buy the spawn figures and put them up on their wall and have their wall full, like this is a piece of pornography for them, I think. <laughs> Todd with that hair. He had that hair. He had a permanent, man. How about that, dude? It's t it turned into a fucking zine. It turned into fact sheet five. I love seeing this stuff put in because it's so rare that he does that yeah and and it makes me think that he's he's trying to simulate a gerhard kind of uh background or something and even with the lettering here it seems like or zakowski's trying to simulate a little bit of uh dave sims lettering man it's it's competing letterers dude like they must have appreciation for one another's skills right dave sim and tom wazakowski yeah i don't know anybody that doesn't appreciate dave sims lettering That's funny. Yeah. Whenever service goes off model in a couple of these. Looks like the fawns. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not funny. That's goddamn scary. Yeah. And also any superhero crying usually doesn't <laughs> doesn't work well. I have to check my uh, my my copies, man. But I wonder if that's like some green gimmicks coming out of those uh, green <laughs> eyes. That feels very cerebus like. Almost, uh, you know, kind of a muted Gerhard background yeah, texture. Yeah, a little bit. It, it's kind of surprising he doesn't go in harder on that. Because it seems like that would be duplicatable. Du duplicatable? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I remember reading, like, I think it's the Comics Journal Gerhard interview, and he talks about his hatching and how it'd be, like, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, you know, like, rotating at each time for each additional layer. That's a phone. <laughs> at first, I was like, what? But... We're in the computer era. You could do desktop publishing. 
And and um, whoever lettered this has the laser printer. That ain't no bubble jet. Man, do you remember those low fidelity 1990s oh, yeah. bubble jets? A little spatter. We haven't seen any of that. This is the stuff where I, uh, even as a kid, I remember thinking like, did did Todd just discover Jeff Darrow? Because there's a lot of like, it's more spare with the spotting of blacks and it's more open. And I actually think the colorist had something to do with that too. This was the issue that I think, I, I like the concept of this issue and I feel like the art fails it, although that splash page is really strong. Yeah. But I like the gangs and I don't think he does their design justice because it, because they look the same. They look the same. They, they, there's just something a little bit uninspired. I found a little uninspired about them. McFarlane would often do these squished, skinny panels and find a way to get both eyeballs right in them. That is, that is a McFarlane trope. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of Truman. Does a lot of those skinny panels, and it's hard. Like you do have to kind of work to get the details to fit in a, a skinny vertical or horizontal panel. You know, I was thinking of uh, Barry Windsor Smith during the Conan era would do the same thing. And he, and he wasn't shy about getting those eyeballs even closer together. That would be a cool toy to have, you know, it Did doesn't he make that toy. No, I don't think so. It doesn't have to be a spawn figure. It could just be, you know, his version of GI Joe or something. Yeah. Right. Once he gets a hole blown in his chest, uh, th this is a motif that'll come back several times, and McFarlane perfects it after a while. There's ribs in it and shit. <laughs> Might even see a little of that in uh, in in this book. That's a little Darrow-esque, right? That uh, hard-boiled cover. Yeah. Look at that stuff, dude. Just <laughs> my buddy used to say shards of flesh whenever uh, we'd watch it. We go faces of death or something. Byron with the backwards R. See, that's some of that strange shadow. We're going to do an outline and let the colorist do something cool with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same deal here. And look at how open that is. It does feel like there's another hand on some of these pages. And it's going to it's gonna get more and more like that. Like, Todd doesn't often do this. Like, I think we'll start to see names like Mark Pennington, I think, uh, shows up. I love whenever you get a big sound effect from uh, Tom Warzakowski, like yeah. some of this stuff. Yeah, really cool. That's so dynamic. You just don't get sound effects like that anymore. No. No, they re they really are just static at this point. That's wild looking. Yeah. Almost a, like a Rick Leonardi leg or so, thigh there. And And I mean, look at the chaos. See, that to me also kind of feels like maybe not McFarlane all over. It almost is like Klaus with some of this. So yeah, some of like the spotting of the blacks in the crowd, it just seems different. Mm -hmm. Even some of this stuff. You're right. That's not ideas. How about a tour de force of uh, Orzakowski? Love it. See, this would have made sense in the Cerebus issue to me. If you were doing the, uh, You're right. anything you can do, I can do better dance. Jesus. Yeah, I would not want to draw that. Jesus. Interesting to see how he's spotting black on this page. Because it's just all chaos, right? Yeah. It's all noise. Except for Spawn clearly stands out, and it's because of that solid black. Yeah, we'll say. And there's one of your tall, skinny panels with those <laughs> eyes. This would be a good one. I had to do the throw the tracing paper down and finish the sides <laughs> of that face. <laughs> and the money shot, man, one of those iconic moments. Chucks his head with no respect. Yeah, I forgot these issues were in here. I was thinking that it ended right, right around here. This is probably around where... Where, uh, oh no, I was going to say where Kiko's doing backgrounds, but uh, Rube, that's Ruben Rude. A lot of interesting clouds and stuff that are drawn in that weird vector program. Pre-Photoshop. It's pretty striking for black and white art. You know, the silhouette of the cross, I think, really really works there yeah. nicely. Yeah, his drapery is fun. Like, you could tell he's just like, whoosh, 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 and then connecting it's lines. It's just abstract. Yeah. Wow. Paste up head, patch. 
Hmm. A little patch piece. That's a ridiculous drawing. It's so big. It encapsulates those nineties, man. It's just about it's just about mania. Getting lines on the page was the equated talented skills. It's fun to see them though switching up. You know, we go from that gritty all those buildings and sharp angles, and now it's like I'll try to do a different style here. The edges of those borders. Another example of him being creative with those, uh, with the page and the page elements. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of lessons to take away. Absolutely not interested in drawing uh, office scenes. <laughs> so we're going to get get that out of the way pretty quick. Someone should do a zine of all the uh, like all the image office scenes from like image year one <laughs> i don't think anybody wanted to draw office scenes no. but all the bad guys had an office they were power brokers dude <laughs> this is one of my favorite spawn without his mask drawings of this of this period a lot of hamburger on that face yes sir medium rare at a certain point why would you ever redraw these guys yeah it's a good question i was looking for like is that little kind of paste ups that we have there i'm amazed that they were able to use real logos for this stuff yeah me too that is uh probably a sign of self-publishing mm -hmm. you know like if you were going to pass that through a marvel dc book you're not getting away with that yeah how did that uh rolling stone was that an issue in uh hulk did they have to wait for feedback on that thing you know, they, they mentioned it, but um, I think it was historic. You know, like that's a historical document, so I think that hopefully, hey, it made it through. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know the particulars, I would, but, but I would, it did come up. I would call your book a, a form of journalism. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> Funny to see him like drawing kids too. Yeah, knowing what Spawn is, what what the money shots of this book are and then you have little kids running around and that is very millerish with the little lamp sort of cut into those guys like this sure. this is a cool direction man yeah it's different doesn't that look like the grandpa from willy wonka who starts the uh starts the movie in that orgy sequence with those other old people and won't get out of bed until he That's gets a golden ticket nightmarish <laughs> This is kind of cool. I like seeing him lean into that 80s, almost like an 80s design. Mm -hmm. Makes me wish I, I'd see like more like an 80s period book by him. Yeah. Just cool drawings, man. Yeah, that's great. That's wild. And once again, there are marks on there that seem bolder than what his usual marks are. Kind of do. Mignola-ish, even, with some of this kind of stuff. That's so simple, this bottom drawing. For McFarlane's style, that feels very, very simple. Yeah, it really makes me wonder, like, what the circumstances are. If somebody is, if they're passing pages around. I also think, like, sometimes these guys would be doing pages on the road, you know. Yeah. San Diego or somewhere, like, at a big convention where you're away for a week. Yeah. And I feel like that's where you would get, like, other people's hands would just kind of come and go. I mean, we could say that this is Jay Lee inspired when you see these weapons and that kind of chapel it had face. To be. I th like, we all saw those Jay Lee chapel images. Look at these blunt bolds right here. I think it's just a damn Sharpie on the underside of these mm -hmm. liquids. It's pretty cool. It does look like a uniform weight. Not a uh, Jay Lee no. chapel there. No, it's now firmly in the McFarland camp. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty dope, dude. Oh, yeah. A little callback there. Technique we saw in the Dave Sim issue. I'm trying to figure out what that is. It looks like it's from a goddamn Sega CD video game. Flight simulator, maybe. This, talking about, like, the lettering. I love it whenever the letters have something then drawn inside of mm -hmm. them. Here's our chance to see a McFarlane uh, stab at some Youngblood characters. That shaft is is rough looking. It is. Do you think that he does that? He goes into business for himself a little bit when he draws the these other characters. 
<laughs> Man, I want to believe it. <laughs> you know, the, the reason I say it, like, when we talked to Rob, and I was like, Rob, man, we just take a look at young uh, Deathmate Red. Kiko's the only dude color in your stuff. <laughs> and he's, he was like, I'm trying to stand out. Like, even amongst his own guys. That's he's good. like, I'm trying to stand out. <clears throat> Speaking of, like, this is just his Sin City. Yeah. Absolutely. There was always something so flat. Once again, I guess it's just those lines. But even when they colored it, it just felt like such a. That's what you would get when image. people will copy somebody. Like you'll see somebody copy a manual or something like that. That's what they'll mess up. Mm -hmm. They'll put certain effects at a place where it's like, no, don't do it on a face. Yeah. Because it does flatten it, or it does. You know, it's counter to what to the style. I guess I didn't realize like how much young blood he drew in this issue i didn't either and i'm kind of delighted to see it that's, yeah. that's very fun from from a nostalgic standpoint <laughs> do you see patterns emerge from his stuff as we're flipping through like like you know five four or five issues in now it feels like this kind of page we've seen a version of this a few times yeah, like more, like less than the art part of it. I think the formula is like we got to get two pages of Terry and Wanda in each issue or something like that. That may be it. We got to keep the B B story going a touch, and we need one page of Sam and Twitch. Like I, th I bet you there's like a very clear or close to clear breakdown. I think there's a pattern too of going in and out with this kind of detail work. And it may be a setting change. You know, yeah. sometimes it's like, this is the clean office, you know, the high rise office. We're not going to do all those kind of little organic hatching. But it, it does feel like there are these beats like that, like a visual beat. Jim, we're back in Jay Lee territory. A yep. little bit. Liking that. A little bit. This is like one of those super. It, it, it wasn't until starting Cartoonist Kayfabe where I understood what, what uh, McFarlane was going for in this issue. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to it. It's almost outlaw, black and white outlaw comics. Oh, totally. Totally. I mean, my whole thesis with Spawn was like, it's it's your hot topic version of Faust. You know, the stuff that you could get at the mall. These are definitely uh, mm -hmm. Xeroxes. Yeah, all, all three, right? Yeah, yeah. It's so noticeable here. It's like the, the printer was running out of toner on her. When he gets the uh, sort of bird's eye view on his characters, they always get stiff. I also don't feel the energy in these pages as some of the previous pages. Mm -hmm. So maybe something's going on at this point. Um, you know, something distracting. This is the stuff that was like... Toy toys are starting to go well. Yeah, yeah, like... <laughs> kind of unclear to me like as a young reader but i mean looking at it it makes sense he grabs he grabs chapel's face after their whole back and forth about you shot me in my head blah 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 you took my face off whatever yes and uh todd needs just a little bit of anatomy lessons man because it's this that screws it up it screws up the whole effect allowing the cartilage and all that so like it needs to be a sinus cavity that's true yeah it would have been very effective. Yeah. It's so funny, like, whenever you're pointing that out, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, you would see Spider-Man and Spawns when they'd get the nose right. shape, and it would always be like, what is that? It yeah. just wasn't right looking, and I feel like maybe it's a nose issue. Right. Because uh, you got the skin, like, it's the skin is totally off. This is supposed to be all skull, you know? But I don't think I realized that at the time at all. What, what was happening there? I thought it was just doing a stylized... That edge around the skin is almost like it's like burn marks. Those little tiny black dots. Mm. Pretty good. Yeah, it makes me think of... I like it, Chop, right? Chop Top from uh, Texas Chainsaw 2. That guy with the little coat hanger. Iconic image. How about them shits right there, dude? The Andre the Giant mouth. Yeah. So disgusting. <laughs> Color change on your paper makes me wonder if they switched up their uh, who was who was printing their image boards. Yeah, looks like Trash Man, Trash it Man does. dollars. Well, Spain Rodriguez not. <laughs> Todd McFarlane, big Spain Rodriguez fan. He'd be like, Clearly. no, I've never been. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when we did our shoot interview with Todd and he spoke for about fifteen minutes about not going to the bathroom and that that was a part of his uh, success. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go see our shooter interview with Uncle Todd. We need to get we need to get that guy back. We do, we do. 
there's something about this approach where like I, I swear if you went through and start counting like how many close-ups on an arm appear or a body part of some sort you know it's a, it's a leg a shoe something but it feels like you're going to see those pop up regularly you know it's it's almost like you get your establishing shot and now we're going to do a couple of close-ups something to make the page look different look interesting not just a repeat of like those two talking heads it is the stuff that does make the the sort of old timers and the traditionalist really really bristle because the idea of the imagery in comics is it must have narrative value and unless this cigarette yeah, it, it feels off. like a like a film technique or something. I really like the way these buildings bleed into the black of the page. Yeah, he's good at that. Yeah, it's really a silhouette technique. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just doing something instead of figures, you're getting those building skyline. The brooding spawn is akin to the brooding silver surfer. Yes, very much so. The close-up eyes, you see a ton of it. That green is also real pleasing whenever Steve Olliff and guys like do their thing. And then like a panel like this to me, we don't see a lot of those. That works really well. It does. And once again, it's another really solid McFarlane car that isn't, you know, referenced. It's, it's, it's his deal. And it looks cool. There's just some, some strange marks, this way that building is drawn with the whites. Yeah. Charles Burns would do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I mean strange by, you know, like McFarlane yeah. standards. When he created that medieval spawn, man, I wonder yeah. if he's like, God damn, I gotta draw another horse. We'll call him back on, on our, uh, our our story style, but we don't go all the way with the lettering. Jimmy, every now and then, an issue of spawn shows up mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the kayfabe mail, and I'll take a look, and it'll be issue 85, 185, you know, 240... And it's all referencing the first 24 issues. It's showing Billy Kincaid doing stuff. It's showing Overt Kill. It's like, did anything happen after the stuff that we read those first two years? Because it's all calling back the same exact shit that we already know. I don't know. I'm baffled. Matt Boris, weigh, weigh in, man. It's so the history of comics, though. It's just maybe this first 24 issues aren't quite as rich as, say, the first uh, first batch of Ditko Spider-Man. Right. <laughs> but you know what? Iconic to me, man. You know, like, that overkill, I get it. I think they have to change that chapel shit, probably. Yeah, I think they phased that out. I, I forget. Uh, yeah, that's been retconned. Pretty early on, too. I think I saw a commenter say something about it <laughs> whenever he had his falling out. Matt Boris, who's the guy who's the assassin? That's pretty fun having your shadows cast on the spawn. Those those feel like uh, something we haven't seen McFarlane do. You know, like trying to figure out this kind of like haunting shadow play. Something to try. And they're the same as the tree branches, which it I, I kind of like that. It adds to the busyness for sure. Like I'm looking at our little thumbnail on our monitor <laughs> and ask me, you know. Yeah, there's some noise on these pages. Straight up Dark Knight Returns right there. And by the way, close up eyes. <laughs> Look at this. A couple of couple of digits with those little corn kernel fingernails man that stuff i, it, I that grosses me out too like the little teeth that, yeah that we'll see and he does that a lot the, those big sausage fingers with the with a little fungus nails I like this perspective on our uh violator face super dynamic yeah it's and, a good shot and look at the it's almost praying mantis like that form yeah the anatomy that he that he invents for it you know, he understands the kind of French braid, like, fade these shapes into each other to create a kind of muscular form, and he just takes it to the next level. I swear this is a character that most, uh, like, those early 90s dudes could not draw. Mm -hmm. Like, when you'd see somebody else draw the Violator, it was the worst-looking character design ever. Yeah. Because it's that McFarlane inking for, like, the whole body texture, and nobody else has that. But I always hated it because it was like, I want, like, roided-up dudes yeah. is what I'm looking for. <laughs> and this kind of, like, weird demonic shape... I used to hate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're on the record, man, for for that. So here's our end papers. Mm -hmm. It's a cover for issue 15. I feel like you get a lot of these pages, too, in uh, Spawn Comics. Yeah, I like that a lot there. I wonder, like, was this backed out in print? Because it's a very sloppy edge. That's a good question. Uh, there... It would make sense. That, like, looking at it, I was like, oh, that should be, ba that should be white 
you know, that should be white on the black background. I bet you it was. Probably. Uh, in previous pages, there were notes to Orzakowski for that, mm -hmm. but maybe the computer technology changed where you got to give that note to the, the colorist. colorist. Yeah. Those eyeballs, Should've boy. counted those. <laughs> I mean, it feels like a McFarlane staple. Yeah. Look at that skinny bone. <laughs> wow. Jimmy, I think we're going to get a hole in the chest with some ribs in this one. I think that's the deal. I think there's some other uh, finger hands on this page, too. So this is making me think of the Baxter paper reprints of Swamp Thing that would have uh, the R Bernie Wrights and stuff, two issues in each with wraparound covers, and one of those covers has a kind of field sequence with these exact trees, man. Like, that, they, these are the marks uh, that... Todd McFarlane's trying to make here. He's he's trying to go rights in with that right there. Also, this is that stuff that I would talk about, like, you know, whenever you're really zoomed in on a hand or something, those marks don't really exist. No. And that's such a zoom in. That's such a close up of that hand to see the amount of textures that are put on top of that. Very clear. Ludicrous. Very, very clear. That's almost John Cleary look. It is. Bite your tongue. <laughs> wonder if he ever assisted McFarlane. It's a good question. I mean, he definitely drew stuff like the toy books that, that came with the action figures. Yeah, he, he did, work. Right. Crew. Did, did work for him. You know, so many of those guys seemed like when they were setting up studios, it was finding guys that, that followed their styles, and that would have been the, the dude. Yeah. <clears throat> Straight out of Hall of Heroes. Close to eyeballs. <laughs> Two on one, sh one sheet, Jimmy. Yeah, that's almost photocopied. Are those the same? I think so. I think so. And it looked, man, there's like the photocopy got bent or something. What are we even looking at here? Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's bizarre. That's really strange. It feels like a wrestling move, like the Lex Luger But he's doing it wrong. Like, uh, Maybe an F5 come out of there. <laughs> this is funny. This... Almost looks like that sketch that we looked at earlier. It's it's lighter lines. It just feels like, wait a minute, is that the is that the underdrawing? Right. Even those background lines that are coming off of it feel uh, like I would expect McFarland to have those just just filling out. Yeah. Look at that interesting frilly gimmick right there. This feels like it got away from him. Unless that's like a cloak or some shit. Yeah, like a sheer. <laughs> it's not negligee. Wearing like a stocking there. The <laughs> I love that the tear. It's, it's like you're almost um, your panel border. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's a poignant moment. Oh, look, it drips too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little puddle, tear puddle. He did such good cityscapes and this is this is a version that you would see like um dick tracy background mm. except much simpler but it's that kind of like just a flat you know that that would be your painting backdrop in a theater production or something love it and, there, and there's even layers of depth mm -hmm. and it makes sense like these are like your you know small town city buildings yeah, and they're, they're close skys in the foreground. skyscrapers in the back a couple lights on a couple people are still up up late watching tv can't sleep would you be able to sleep in a neighborhood where this shit is happening, Jimmy? <laughs> That's a good point. Where every time you turn around, the damn homeless guy's getting put on fire? I'm amazed by this one squiggle of a of a texture. Yeah. We've seen it a few times now, but it's literally like you've got a pen, you know, a rapidograph or something. Like, you can't do that with a Hunt 102. Possibly you could, but not really. Yeah. You know, that's some kind of a roller rolling ball pen, a ballpoint. Micron. Yeah, yeah. You know, the like, and it's faded more than like a lot of the black. Same, same as this. This is just it's micron pens or something. Mm -hmm. Also, if you just isolated that, I like I have pages of my own seventh grade comics like that are exactly that. You, you, I think we all do. <laughs> this is this is you could find bricks from from a lot of comics that would fit that. Hey, I like this sequence of the guys fighting, like the silhouette and then the outline shape, and and little like that's a fun layout that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, agreed. You know, this this panel, this is a panel we see. It's mm -hmm. a close-up of an arm. 
I just wonder about like the philosophy of, of some of these choices because they're really repeated. This hand thing, it's making me think about McFarlane was asked on the, the, the comic book resources uh, yacht at San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, one of those like desert island conversations, like what, what, what comic are you going to take on the island with you? And he's like, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to take my omnibuses of uh, Tomb of Dracula, Gene Colan, Marv Wolfman. And if you look through those comics, every issue has these close up hands opening doors and stuff. Yeah. And part of that, I think, is deadline. You know, th these kind of because it's a way that you don't have to draw a lot of background. You don't have to draw a full figure, but it's dramatic. Yeah. It's cinematic. Yeah, I, I, I like the uh, I like seeing the patterns. If you're tuned into it, that's one thing. But for me, it's like these guys make it interesting looking, mm -hmm. and that's a different level of you know. There's it's not nothing in terms of thought and you know the process of just getting it done. I like this lettering a lot. Yeah, dude, a little dry brush thing. And this actually feels like the very first time that that texture ever kind of could apply in the actual drawing because it really does just look like a fucked up screen door. Yes. This this page though feels very far removed in terms of McFarlane art from the stuff in the beginning. It of does. This book. Yeah, yeah. There's. There, I feel like there's guys coming in and like because like even what is that like like is that a tangent? Is that a violator hoof? <laughs> because like that can't be him, could it? You know what it is, and I think they lose some of the the knee. Yeah. You know, like this this the way I see this, that's part of your thigh in this drawing. But I bet you that should be like maybe a calf. Yeah. The way I see this is a, a horse, a <laughs> horse foot. Like, like this is not a foot in my mind. I, it's supposed to be a foot. It would have the bone right there and you'd be able to tell. But it's like that second knee that animals get. It is. And, and because of the way this is kind of drawn and there's light on that foot, it's almost a hoof or like a, like a bovine <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> happening. And and then it looks like the Corinthian, like a bunch of mouths. You know what? I was going to say the same thing. That's another face. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Stuff's wrong on that draw. Somebody, something else was happening. That 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 was a quick one. There's a uh, there's an ego column where he's talking about like finishing up a page for the FedEx right truck. I think that was the page. It might be. Man. <laughs> might be. Oh, dude, the corner box. Sweet. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, that's a super cool artifact. I like seeing that. I didn't remember that. I always love this too. Yeah. Whenever, uh, whenever I finally get around to an artist edition, like I want to do zooms like this on the artwork. Makes sense, man. There goes your squiggle again. You I saw find it a few there. places. It's it's interesting because I can almost imagine it as a color hold or something. You see the faded line, so it's definitely him going in at the last minute, ho hooking it up with even more micron marks. Look at that man, that's a Christian Bale. <laughs> Christian Bale from uh, The Fighter is playing McFarlane in the movie, man. I think he did a good job with this as an artist edition. Sure. sure. I think the art looks really good, you know, the reproduction of it. You get a lot of value in the blacks and in just the page kind of changing color a little bit. Yeah. Um, those are qualities that don't always come through. Like sometimes I think people blow out the levels and then it's like, ah, it's kind of a like a photocopy, like a high, totally. high contrast photocopy. I want all of that variation. And, you know, from a production standpoint, like it's a good book. Now you guys know that this is a precursor for the pre-ordered Todd McFarlane, Amazing Spider-Man artist edition that I actually think is coming out the same day as the Red Room Trigger Warnings trade paperback. No way. And the uh, Hulk Grand Design Marvel Treasury edition. So, Guys, you're going to the comic shop. You got to save up two hundred bucks. Yeah, that's a big day. You got to save up two hundred bucks maybe, maybe for that's September twentieth. Uh, Todd can join, can rejoin Cartoonist Cafe. That would make sense. Big event. Oh, uh, he wouldn't want to promote that shit. <laughs> that ain't spawn. Good to go. Yes. All right, Kayfabers. Christmas in July is the last Saturday of July, and what we want you to do is go to those uh, little pop up libraries, those free little libraries in your neighborhood and around your city, and drop off some uh doubles and if you're a maker out there we have a lot of comic book makers in the house jimmy we get a lot of mail 
from people, why don't you drop a couple of copies off in those free little libraries and, and, and start uh, a new comics reader off right. Also, like, follow, and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness are in stores everywhere. It is the, my retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I'm writing, drawing, coloring, lettering, all of that stuff. So grab those the next time you go to the local comic shop. And follow me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see more of my art, download out-of-print zines and minis, all that good stuff. Red Room Trigger Warnings, Issue 1, 2, 3, and 4 are on the stands as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Funded Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Every issue stands alone. You see an issue, scoop it up, give it a sample, you dig it, grab another. You can uh, order and pre-order these comics at my link tree in the description below because the comic is banned in more than 28 countries, banned in more than 10 comic shops. Or, if you need uh, expediency, you go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks will get you the archive there. More than 200 pages worth of comics, probably approaching 250 at this point. Three bucks for that archive new strips every Tuesday. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel. Given those marching orders, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.